what is going on guys welcome back to the channel critical overload here so we're going to be going over and recapping phil rosenberg's scrapped tossed in a dumpster screenplay named halloween 666 the origins or origins it would have been the sixth entry in the halloween franchise but we thankfully got something a whole lot more well not a whole lot more but definitely well written compared to this travesty and this would have basically had a hobo myers it would have dived into one of the weirdest bizarre origins for the shape we would have ever gotten tommy doyle had a vr machine loomis was in a sanitarium or in an institution because he had his own personal demons and he had a heart attack but i'll just start recapping this story which essentially revolves around a chicago news crew coming to haddonfield to cover a story about the town lifting the halloween ban that they had in place for five years but it begins with a new lead character named dana childress who is having an urban legend like nightmare of driving down a deserted road during a downpour anxiously looking in the mirror feeling that she's being followed as her gas gauge nears empty she happens to find an isolated gas station um she pulls in and is greeted by a creepy attendant who pumps her gas and cleans her windshield and back glass suddenly the attendant attacks her car or starts attacking her car smashes away at the glass until his throat is slit Dana turns to see Michael Myers in her back seat and just as he wipes his blade towards her she wakes up and jots the details of her nightmare into a notebook. The following day at her therapist's office she discusses her dreams where we learn that she continuously has dreams of this nature always between the hours of midnight and one o'clock. Her therapist suggests that she could be the manif that that they could be the manifestation of some childhood fear or desire that's lurking within. Dana returns to work after her session, where it's established that she's the newest member of the Channel Six news team based in Chicago. In a staff meeting with her producer, she pitches a potential story regarding the town of Haddonfield lifting the five-year ban on the celebration of Halloween, believing that it could be the story of growth and healing. And she's given the assignment. Dana and a handful of colleagues, senior journalist Robert Clifton, sound guy Tony, cameraman Blake, and driver Danny, or Andy, then venture to Hattonfield for Dana's first big story. Meanwhile, maskless Michael Myers is leaving or living on the streets as one of the homeless, and after killing a group of drunken frat boys who assaulted him while he was just trying to catch some shut eye in an alley he ventures to a homeless shelter where he is established as a regular michael receives several nods from his fellow homeless upon entering but is soon distracted by a channel 6 promotional ad for dana's story about haddonfield setting michael on a trek back to his old stomping grounds back in haddonfield grown-up tommy tommy doyle lives in his own attic while renting out the rest of the house to a couple of dickhead teenagers who constantly make fun of him tommy it turns out has been obsessed with michael myers and is trying to learn the secret behind the evil that lurks within him tommy has a high-tech setup of computer equipment including a virtual reality ouija which he uses in an attempt to seek out the origin of michael's evil but he's constantly hitting a roadblock and can't go beyond a certain point this device comes into play later on in the movie and again like i mentioned this is going to give you one of the most unnecessary and far-fetched glimpses into the events that ultimately caused michael myers to become the shape Tommy also keeps himself occupied by protesting against the town lifting the ban of Halloween via shouting incorrect victim names through a megaphone as Tommy feels that removing the ban and allowing the citizens of Haddonfield to celebrate the holiday disgraces the victims as well as fearing that it will bring Michael Myers back. Dr. Sam Loomis is only featured in one scene in this script in what is meant to be a passing of the torch from him to Tommy. Tommy attempts to find Loomis hoping to convince him to return to Haddonfield as he is sure Michael will return. However, Loomis has committed himself to an institution following his heart attack at the end of the fifth film, believing that he carries too many demons. Ben Meeker is also mentioned in the screenplay a few times. So Ben Meeker is revealed to be someone who survived that shootout at the end of Halloween 5 in this iteration of 6, as opposed to the sixth film they actually got, where it seems Ben Meeker is killed in the last events from 5. So meeker is shown keeping a watch out from within the myers house he comments on how him and his wife have to endure kids running around 
wearing the mask of the man responsible for killing his daughter years earlier. When Dana and the rest of the useless Channel 6 news team enter town, they encounter a strange character named Father Carpenter, who is incorrectly listed as the priest from Halloween 4. But the reason that makes doesn't make any sense is because that dude was named Sawyer. So naming him Father Carpenter here is ridiculous, unless you explain that he's faking his name, which this screenplay never does. So it seems as though this is just a plot hole. Because then what it also does is it backtracks even further on that character. That character in 4 told us that he was hunting evil or damnation or something like that. He was a, he was a defendant of the Lord's work. Here, though, he's revealed to be the man in black. He was responsible for the shootout in Halloween 5. So it doesn't sound like Mr. Rosenberg, Phil Rosenberg, was writing this, keeping a lot of the continuity in mind. It sounds like he just started doing a lot of Pretty Little Liars and mistakes. Dana and her team conduct several interviews through town, and Dana runs into Tommy, who warns her not to get too close to her story. After the two-part ways, Clifton informs Dana that Meeker gave them a list of survivors, although when she asks Clifton if the name Tommy Doyle means anything, he responds, no. This actually makes no sense because Tommy Doyle is a survivor. So that's one of the other incoherent subjects in this screenplay. Um, later on, they interview Meeker from the Myers house and then they follow it up with an interview with Frank and June Wallace, parents of Lindsay Wallace from the first film who have stayed in Haddonfield because they love the town. And here it's casually mentioned that they were once friends with the Myers family. The Wallaces show old home movie footage to Dana and her crew, and it's revealed that Dana is another long lost sibling to Michael Myers. Oh, here we freaking go again. <laughs> A Laurie Strode substitute, if you ask me. While Dana and her crew have been interviewing people throughout the day, they have been unknowingly stalked by Michael, and as they talk to the Wallaces, Michael awaits outside. At one point, he approaches the door and rings the doorbell multiple times. Frank Wallace answers the door angrily, believing that it's just someone from the town who ignores the candle lit for the victims but he tries to slam the door in the person's face it's michael of course michael's hand gets caught in it michael ends up pulling his hand away after the person at the door injures his hand he smears blood all over the peephole frank brushes off the incident as just being a prank from one of the disrespectful punks from the doyle house across the street after the whole movie is finished dana decides that she wants to talk to tommy doyle and her and her crew venture over while their driver andy sleeps in the van uh, the Doyle house, there's a large Halloween party going on. It's being thrown by the teens that live in Tommy's house. Dana and her crew cannot reach Tommy, so they ultimately decide to just screw it and leave. Um, so, Tommy, while they were trying to reach him, was just once again strapped into his virtual reality program. The, they end up leaving, looking to head back to the Myers house once more, uh, just as Tommy's, Tommy's finishing using his machine. As the new van, news van takes off, Tommy notices that the Channel 6 logo has a bloody alteration with two more sixes added to it. Unknown to everyone in the shrubs outside of the Wallace home is the deceased body of their driver, Andy. So who the hell is driving their van? In the rear of the van, Dana and her crew are jolted by the van's excessive speed until they come to a stop. Dana expresses a desire to get out of town as soon as possible, to which Clifton agrees once their business is done at the Myers house. The crew exit the back of the van to find that they are not at the Myers house, but are instead in the middle of nowhere, stuck in a bog. The crew then find that Andy is missing at the front and that the van is empty. Tony and Blake go searching for Andy while Clifton stays with Dana at the van. After 20 minutes pass and there's no word from any of them, Dana and Clifton venture out from the van and discover Blake's camera. They watch the footage, witnessing the deaths of Tony and Blake. And then they hurry back to the van. Dana climbs into the rear while Clifton makes his way to the front. Michael shows up, but they're able to get out of danger. Michael on or while on the road, not too long later, Dana informs Clifton of what she discovered of her heritage at the Wallace's. But they're brought to a sudden halt as Father Carpenter steps into the road. As Father Carpenter begins to spew his cryptic messages regarding the time between or the time between 12 to 1, Michael manages to catch up and kills Clifton. Panicked, Dana flees and heads back to the Doyle house. She manages to get through to Tommy, and after some persistence, Dana tries the virtual reality, virtual reality machine in an effort to learn of Michael's origin so they can stop him. Michael isn't too far behind and crashes the party, and as Dana experiences this simulation, she tries to get to, or Michael is trying to get to the attic. Dana uses Tommy's virtual reality Ouija program uh, to see where the curse of their bloodline really began. Desperate for a clue on how to stop him once and for all, going back to an ancient Celtic settlement, 
Around 1000 BC, it's established that there was a young man known as the Sacral King who had a full year to live his life to the fullest and experience all the pleasures he could withstand before he would be sacrificed in a Druidic ritual to please the gods. The Sacral King speaks to the minister as he begins to have doubts and second thoughts, but the minister explains that he must do this or they will suffer the wrath of the gods. Afterwards, we're brought to the night of the ritual, where the Sacral King, wearing a deer head mask, arrives. The high priest completes the ritual by slitting the throat of the Sacral King, but afterwards, when the deer head mask is removed, it's revealed to be the ministered revealed to be the minister who was bound and gagged and put in the place of the true sacral king that sounds like some halloween resurrection shit <laughs> this had angered the gods and the true sacral king this angered the gods and the true sacral king actually fleed the village as it came to ruins the high priest vows to curse this man's bloodline to fall at the hands of one of their own on a night when the constellations would align the same as they do this very night and as it turns out that night would have been halloween night in 63 when michael killed judith the constellations aligned and a vapor mass arises from the ground up into the mask of six-year-old michael myers through this virtual reality machine revelation dana discovers that between midnight and one o'clock a portal would open to judith judith myers grave site and the only way to stop michael would be to lead him there and send him through the portal returning his evil to where it belonged also through this simulation we are given a glimpse of jamie lloyd who cries out from a cell made of bone but nothing is really elaborated with her fate Michael busts his way through the attic, but Dana gets away and desperately attempts to reach the graveyard. With limited time on the clock, Michael follows her. The portal opens, and after a brief struggle, Dana manages to send Michael through. Just after, Tommy and his annoying roommate show up and place Judith's headstone back where it belonged, sealing the portal. Exhausted, Dana walks away, seemingly victorious, but Father Carpenter happens to be hanging around and laughing, and that's when Tommy notices that it's well after 1 o'clock, leaving the door open for any potential sequels to follow. Now, if you've been listening to me, Notice how a lot of this screenplay is ignoring the continuity established in Halloween 4 and 5. And again, shout out to the Horror Syndicate for recapping this screenplay. I'll leave a link to their site and a link to the script in the description if I can find a link to the script. But this is a pretty awful screenplay. The way they use Loomis, the basic basic cameo of uh, Meeker is really unnecessary. The, the Ouija stuff, the virtual reality, the, the abysmal origins of Michael. Terrible. Ho the hobo stuff. What are we looking at? Or what, what am I reading? <laughs> but I'm glad this was not our Halloween 6. Let me know what you guys think about this down in the comment section below. If you haven't already, of course, make sure you subscribe. Turn on post notifications so you never miss a video. In the description, I'll have links on my social media accounts. I am on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can message me there, of course. Let me know if there's any movies, news, or reviews you'd like me to cover in the future. And with all that in mind, guys, I will see you in the next video.